coupling monthly since uh, starting it in 2012. Very glad you're here because uh, we want to do this. We've been doing this regularly and, and, it, and we enjoy meeting our community. Yeah, it's a gathering of our community, our friends and our allies to share the stories of our lives, our heritage, history, hopes and ambitions and trials and tribulations. And, and we found that the strength of our community lies in the power of the stories we share with each other. So we invite you to partner with us uh, through your participation and support on the web on our website, you know, www.1882foundation.org. Happy to have your comments and 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 participation and collaborating uh, with us because we have many uh, partners and collaborators uh, that we work with. You know, some of our partners in this experience has been the OCADC. Asian Pacific American Advocates, the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, uh, the DC Chinatown Service Center, you know, that Chinese American Art, uh, Chinese American Museum in DC, and the DC Public Library. So please, you know, feel, let us know if you're interested in joining us and you have stories that, that you want us to pursue, or if you want to present stories, our talk story, we're happy to have you here. You know, today's talk story is, is sort of a celebration of Ching Ming Day, which, uh, you know, also known as Tomb Sweeping Day, uh, where we honor our ancestors. So uh, our executive director, Ted Young, is going to present the program. You know, it's based on, you know, it's called Walk the Mountain. You know, it's a look at one family's genealogy book, you know, the Gong family. So Ted Young, uh, let me turn it over to you and let's let's get the program going. Hey, thanks, Stan, and thanks, Bianca, and thanks everyone for coming. It's such a beautiful day today. I don't know what part of the country you are, but in Washington, D.C., it's such a wonderful day. You guys ought to get out uh, and take a look, but I'm happy to have you here. And I hope that you can use the chat room, uh, the chat function, uh, just to give a shout out to somebody you know or just say hello and uh, also asking questions from there. And we'll also have, as usual, our question and answer, or at least a chat room, um, sort of like a hangout period. So what I'm gonna try to do is a number of things. And uh, it's a kind of a mishmash of stuff. Uh, uh, it's appropriate for us to do it on Easter day and uh, Easter Sunday, and also for our Qingming. Both days are similar in some ways. They, they take us out uh, to our places of remembrance and try to remember, be together with families and try to remember that uh, linkage and so forth. What I want to do is actually talk about three sort of combined together three events that we have done in the past. But we've been doing this for about 10 years now, Stan and I and May and all the other people that have been with us. And many of our programs that we have done in the past, we're beginning to think, people, we we're beginning to think we should revive a few of them because people have asked about topics that we have done before or are interested in things that they didn't hear and they wanna, they wanna hear it now or hear it again. And what we've done with Ching Ming, so what I've done is taken two or three things. Many, many people in many of our programs have asked about genealogy books, workshops and searching of things. And so I would say, oh, we've done that before. But we've done that as a, in this case, uh, we had uh, Chinatown Roots give a talk to us and the, uh, the speaker was late. And so I ginned up something to have a 30 minute program about my genealogy record. So that's one of the things that we're gonna talk about, I'll bring that up. And then I also wanna bring up something about uh, range 99, which were uh, some of the burial practices that people historically have done in China and America. And then also uh, the current state of a project that we have there in the congressional cemeteries. So I've kind of put these things together and I hope it works. And uh, in the process of talking about this thing, I hope that we bring up some interesting ideas. Uh, so one of the things is about the Chinese uh, Gong family genealogy book where the Gong, uh, uh, the Jiang Jiapu or Zupu. And our book, the genealogy book, many people, people have, many people have this and our book, is not in very good shape. <laughs> Let me show you what it is. There is a section 
that looks like this. A lot of this is loose print. As you can see, it's beginning to tear off in different places. And we'll go into some of what it covers. Some of the things for genealogy purposes. Uh, first of all, I like to say that, uh, 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 let's see what happened here. Okay, so first of all, so the first front page of the my genealogy record I have at home is uh, looks like this. It has these words, uh, uh, and we'll talk about that. Those, uh, those are very important characters for us uh, because they're part of the, a um, part of a saying from the Analects, which was written by Confucius. And it's uh, basically the first part that says, as you see there, let there be careful attention to perform the funeral rites to parents and let them be followed. But long gone when the ceremonies of sacrifices, then the virtue of the people will ensue its proper excellence. So this is actually written by Confucius. And part of what I'm going to try to show you is, well, I'll give you some background about this book. So it came to me from a grand uncle. I was beginning to do, do genealogy searches. And I was living in Taiwan at that time. And one day, this uncle knocks on the door and says, hey, Ted, here's this book. You may find it interesting. And that's how I got a hold of that book. I'm not sure how other people can get theirs. I've seen copies of other people's things. And there's a lot of, a lot of these type of books stored up in different uh, museums, particularly, uh, say, if you're with the, uh, 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 the genealogy collections over in Utah with the Mormons, they have a large collection. You know, uh, before we go there, I was just going to point out that, uh, okay, we'll do that. You flip over the page, and if you could see, this is what a typical job looks like, or Zubu looks like. It starts off, basically, they're showing the names of your ancestors. And in this case, uh, it uh, starts off, as you can see in the Yu Dynasty, and that's like 2000 something BC. I'm not sure how historical it really is, but the very first person we have is a guy named Yun Jung. And if you follow the record, just to give you a sense of how to read these things and what they do, you have the name of the dynasty, you have the di uh, the first first uh, di uh, the first ancestor. This is his name. He marries. Uh, he is. Uh, his first uh, name plus his given name. And then this talks a little bit about him. Uh, actually, it talks about uh, the fact that there was once a, a country called Bo, uh, Gong, and that's where we took our name. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But it shows here that he's married to a woman with this name, and they have four sons. One, two, three, four sons. And so this gets into the Xiao Dynasty. And the line that we follow for us gongs is from this first person who is there. Nothing particularly important to him happens. He gets married to this person. They have one son. Now, there's, I don't know how historical this is. There's no, the Yu dynasty is the mythical dynasty. This is the guy that created agriculture, rain, and that sort of stuff. Shaw dynasty, there's a historical record of that dynasty, but there isn't really any archaeological evidence, at least at the time that I was doing this this type of, of work. So anyway, I could trace my line to over 2000 BC if I believe on, in this. And these guys, this gives me names of people. This son, yeah, this person who married this person who had one son, and this person uh, begat, uh, had did this, and marries this person and has two sons and it goes on and on. That goes on for pages and pages. Here we show that this guy had two wives, Sing Zhou and Ding. And it shows also that he was probably in fields or got some kind of reward, had two sons, and it goes on. So that record goes back for pages and pages. And there are places like this where uh, we go through the different dynasties. And this is the Zhou dynasty. This is a, uh, this dynasty also is not quite sure. It's, uh, uh, this is the time of, uh, of uh, just before uh, before the warring states period. But this also tells us that our little kingdom of Gong gets destroyed. <laughs> and, that's, and then we have to start our wanderings, page after page of stuff that goes over here. The same pattern is this way. And it goes on until we get to this page. And in this page, what happens is 
uh, we begin to see, I don't know if we can, here we have, this is where, this is probably more, the most accurate part of our record. The other stuff we can say is some hearsay or something that these people attach to make, make sure that our record goes back 2000 years before Christ. But anyway, uh, this is the record for the Huaxian, the Huayu, uh, Pingshan, Chun village, and the Gong clan's uh, uh, genealogy record. And so the, this is pretty interesting. Uh, in, it tells a little bit more detail. And like all sort of these genealogy records, it starts off very similarly in the sense that they have a flourishing, flourishing statement about people having roots and trees having roots and there's water having sources and so forth. And then it goes into talking about where the Gong name came from. And eventually how they talk about this and the Gong is in Shandong area. It's, weaved, it's woven between two warring states, big states. And so eventually it gets destroyed during the disorders and disruptions that occur there. And you can actually follow this record and it'll tell where the Gong clan moved from Shandong down to Jiangxi near, uh, uh, near the Fu Chen. And one of the interesting things here, after they get two or three brothers here, they wind up in the Jiangxi, in Jiang, Fu Yue, and then they cross. This area is pretty important. It's called the uh, uh, Mei Ling. And that, that's a thing, that's a, there's a famous passage that's the uh, uh, Lingnan area, and they come into Guangdong. So at this point, that's when, this is a, this is a mountain range that separates the, uh, the Yangtze River uh, watershed area and then the Pearl River area. So we actually become Cantonese at this point. In the old days when, uh, when people were, uh, were punished, the fish were punished, they were sent south of the Lingnan Mountains. That's the Guangdong area, the Guangzhou area. And they were sent there to be punished actually because uh, the malaria and stuff was there that you probably die. But in any case, we cross here in this area and they show us exactly where we are. If you can read this, it goes on to different districts, shows eventually how we get to Guangzhou area. Up north of Guangzhou, we get settled in the area called, um, eventually it's called Panyu. That's where the area is, where we are, Fayu. That's this district here. So we go on and they say how we got settled, what we were doing, what we were doing, uh, not in the area we were. So we could actually trace the actual village area where we, uh, where we are. Since this was part of a ge genealogical workshop, I was showing how you can actually show the dates, the pretty accurate, how you read the dates in these, in these Chinese records. And uh, here you can show very accurately when this thing was written, actually this is how it can be done. Three, there are three editors to this, this particular version of the job that we have. And it shows that the first editor uh, wrote this during the Ming Dynasty, during the reign of this emperor in the Ming Dynasty on the 12th year of that, 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 that dynasty. And that equates, the way, you, the way you didn't tell what year that is in our term, Western, year is that you take the reign year, Ming Dynasty starts in 1402, and then you plus 12, which is right here, plus 12, and you get 1414. So we know that this record was actually written or copied in 1414, then it was rewritten during the Da Qing, the, Tang, the Qing Dynasty in the Dao Guang year, ninth year Dao Guang period, which equates to 1829. So there was rewritten, and then it was rewritten again in Mingguo, Sanshi Banyan, that's the year of the Republic. And that's the 38th year of the Republic, which puts it into 1949. And that's this guy who handed to me the copy of the book. So if you're in a genealogy records and you're into doing Chinese genealogy, you need to find, this is how you date yourself, date your records. So the part then changes a little bit. And we know that we're now in the Guangdong area. And there is this guy, the first dragon. I love the name for us. Uh, my son loves his name. He's the first dragon. He tells again the story of how the Gong name came from uh, a, a small country that was destroyed and during the disorders. And uh, that was happening up in central China and eventually moved down to different parts of the, the China. 
to reach Guangdong. And then eventually this guy is in Guangdong and he is the first generation that we're going to start counting down from. And the second generation is this guy in 872. And he is the line that we're going to trace for us. <clears throat> he has four sons. <clears throat> so the line that we trace goes here and it comes down, 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 down. All this is saying here is that this is the fifth generation. Here's his name. He marries a person with this stern name and he lives till the year eight. He's 81 when he dies. And he's 78 when he dies and so forth. So it goes on and on. He begat this guy, begat this guy, begat this guy. And our book flips over and it goes to different pages. And we follow this line, follow this line, follow this line. And we eventually follow the line down to this. This is the 32nd generation where C. Trung wrote, rewrote the book. 30, oh, or right here is where he's, the C. Trung is on this line, generation line somewhere. And then, but on this is the guy that we, is my great grandfather. He's the first to actually come to the United States. Comes to the United States, works at the wharf in San Francisco, then eventually goes back to China, gives birth to my grandfather. And he comes back to the United States and to work on, uh, he's a merchant at that time. And he comes in as an exception to some of the rules, the Chinese exclusion rules. And then here, is my father's generation, the 34th generation, my father, my uncle Joe, and my uncle Herbie. And then we are born in the United States, the 35th generation, 34, 33, 34, 35. And that's Elliot, my eldest brother, Mel, my second brother, and me. So I'm here in the 31st generation. And down here in the 36th generation is Russell, my son, and off transition, transition uh, tradition, I put Allison, my daughter, and Aiden, my little son, and Kyle, my other little son. And here, I put the 37th generation, which is baby X. So those guys of you guys who know Allie and Russell, hello, everybody. <laughs> you, uh, we're announcing that he has a baby coming. And so our line <laughs> continues. One more dragon, one more dragon. So we, so if you guys got good names for him, let me know. Uh, he wants to be called Dragon something, but I don't know. You know, the one one thing is that I've gone back to China and uh, it's, I, I worked in China for several years and then uh, with the embassy in Kassa. And one of the things we did when we first got to China, it was still, when the embassy was just open, the council was just open. The uh, Cultural Revolution wasn't that far away. The communes were still in existence. So a lot of the cemeteries or the places or the grave sites where people had buried their ancestors, a lot of those uh, cemeteries were destroyed actually. Uh, the, the headstones and so forth were picked up, torn up and given to, um, to create more farmland and especially during the Cultural Revolution. And a lot of the stones were, headstones were put into parks. So if you go to Guangzhou and you go to Yuexiu Park, uh, you walk up the steps in different places and you kind of look down and you see and they're actually like tombstones from the things that the 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 cultural revolution is particularly broke up and made into public works or public places so this is actually the gravesite where my father uh great grandfather and grand and ancestors were that's what's left of it the uh the relatives there tried to maintain them by building up these little mounds so literally to walk up the mountain, this Du Qingming, you did this, you Hang San went up to the mountain and these were this, the, the scenes that were at that place. So at the time that I took these pictures, they were doing replantings of uh, uh, rice and so forth. You see the very thick ones, the rice seedlings, and then they plant it. And that's the scene from that spot where the cemetery is, where the gravesite is. If, uh, if we went to the actual village where my father, uh, uh, grandfather and, and great grandfather lived, this was this. Uh, when Moki and I got married uh, and like all wives that came into the village, we had to go through under this tree and this is the village and we go underneath this tree and all people, all the wives were brought into the village through that tree. And we would walk through the village and these were the village scenes. Eventually we came to this, this is actually our house 
where my great grandfather and my father actually lived for a show. Wow. And this is interesting. There's my beautiful wife reaching, becoming part of the family and reaching to what was in those job who where it says, the water, you have to wash yourselves and you're part of this water, this source. And so and that's what she, we also had this banquet, which uh, I don't know how appreciative she was, but it included all kinds of the old village uh, food that included like pangolins and things of this sort. So that was interesting. But the other thing about Jabu is that you find other records. Our, our Jabu, our genealogy records, not very extensive, not very long. I remember seeing something that Yo-Yo Ma had, and he had thick books of various things that contained in his Jabu. But in uh, records and a lot of narratives in ours, ours didn't have very much narrative at all. But these Jabus, I've seen many of them have these type of records or comparison things. This is that one line of that uh, came from Si Chong. And you can see that this is a record of the size of growth and of the families that were coming from that line. So that the very first one you see at the end was the, uh, the year um, in the Yuan dynasty and uh, uh, the 14th generation. And that's the first person number one at the on your left. And then you go through over the years, like uh, it starts in like, what is it? 12, 13 to 22 and it goes to 1950. So you see how the families have risen and fallen during the size, during the 1700, 1704, it grows rapidly. 1759, this is the, the, the Qing dynasty, very stable until, until very suddenly 1868, it begins to drop and it drops even further in 1895, 1922, it begins to disappear in 1950. I was born in 1951, it disappears. So what happened? You can see that uh, this is the period of the Opium War, 1840, and then the revolution, uh, fighting during World War II. And this is the year in which uh, uh, we begin to immigrate to the United States. Gold rushes in the 1840s and 50s, this period, people begin to leave. So that's, so back to the job and the purpose of it, this is actually a cemetery area in uh, Qingming, during Wen Qingming in Fresno, California. And this is a cemetery where uh, it was a combined cemetery for the people from Nanai, Pan Yu, and Shunda, and then Pa Yu. So our district is here. So this is a combined cemetery where the Qingming uh, uh, events are still done. You're still doing, you're still, still being done there. There's my, my brother and another part of the same cemetery. We're not walking in the mountains because we're in Fresno, but we're there at the Chinese cemetery doing these type of events. My, my brother also very nice. I think that if you look at Qingming today, if you go to some of the larger cemeteries or if you go to Hong Kong, if you've been to Guangzhou, Qingming, you'll be really like tons of people, busloads of people going things going there, but I think that this is very nice, where the essence of what we're trying to do is simply to honor our parents. Here's another one in Washington, D.C. So these events in which we try to honor people represented by the job who the, uh, is still being done. This, this sort of warning, this, the statement that was at the beginning of our job, who, let, you know, the that is so key to understanding why these, uh, why Qingming is so important and how this representation, the genealogy representation is so important for us. So if you define yourself and identify yourself as part of this long linkage to 2000 years of generations after generation of people, and then follow up with what you're doing today, it's so important for us to know who we are, what we're doing. It gives us a little bit more, sense of, uh, of uh, something that is more than just this particular life. But if we go back to Fresno and we look at these, uh, this is the Fresno Cemetery, the Chinese portion of the Fresno Cemetery. This is what's left of the cemetery. We used to be quite large, mostly Taishan people. And nobody's taking care of these things anymore. They're kind of getting kind of lost. It seems kind of more lonely because it's sort of like in a desert area, I think. 
Here's another Chinese cemetery in California, also largely abandoned. This is in Auburn. Auburn is right there with start uh, between uh, above Sacramento, in which this is actually the start of where the Chinese were beginning to hire, be hired to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. So again, it's a lonely picture of what's going on. And the question is what happens when you have nobody doing the rights that uh, Confucius asked us all to pay attention to. So as I said, that little Auburn Cemetery relates to these people that were building the Transcontinental Railroad. And if they disappear, who takes care of them? So this is what happens. Uh, you have, so it is important for the people to have their bones or their remains returned back to some place where the rights can continue. Here's a report in 1870 of what happens when you die in the United States, like you, some many of the workers did, and you need to uh, uh, be sent back to China. So one of the key things that was in the contracts for the railroad workers was that if they died, their bones would be shipped back to China, back to their home village to be taken care of. Here's an 1870 report, Bones in Transit. Talks about 20,000 pounds of bones representing 1,200 Chinese killed while employed by the railroad. Another record talks about, and this record is in 1909, the return to China, and this is from the Evening Star in Washington, D.C. He says, back to your orange. Even after 1870, 1909, you still had people digging up the bones and sending them back to China because it was so important, so important as part of that larger, uh, largest, larger issue about having rights taken care of. Even Mark Twain talked about it. He talked about the need for these uh, rights to continue. And he explains how these bones are actually taken care of by say organizations such as the different Tongs, and in our case, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. Here's a picture in 1903 of San Francisco where funeral rites and Qingming issues are being taken care of, and probably the disinterment of the bones. When the bones were buried at a certain time, they were then re-dug, re they were dug up and cleaned up, and here's, uh, here are instructions of what you need to do when you had you took up these bones i think it you they they had these instructions that had to be you had to account for each of these bones before you shipped them back to china including for example the uh hair braid these are books from largely from canada uh, who actually had uh the chinese and north america research center and they are basically list account books of how, how, how they account for the bones and when they ship them. Interestingly, you know, these are a list of the people sent back to different uh, places, Taishan being the largest, 324 sets of bones, Kaiping, Xinwei, An, Enping. All these are part of our uh, districts where most of our people have come from the United States, uh, come to work in the United States. The book on the right uh, is actually from Hanford, California, not far from Fresno. And uh, those people call this book the Bone Book Repatriation. It's more of an account book. It says, Pan Yi, Pan Yi is the district just south of China, Guangzhou, at Jingsan from San Francisco, and the record, this is an account record of the bone ship back or coffin sent back. I thought it's interesting to that they have six women, one man, and they talk about women being sent back. And I thought it was interesting actually to add this piece of information here. This is a, a record that shows the individual is accounted for. And there actually is a woman here who, who in most cases, I think, uh, are people who died in birth. And so there is a mother who actually has a baby accounted for and sent back with her. I think in the Canadian records, there was like 16 out of 600 bodies of women being sent back. And almost all of them were people with young, with births. Maybe the child is not listed, but they say accompanied by a baby. So it tells a little bit about, tells a little bit about the life in, for Chinese Americans in the United States or in Canada. 
And I think it's quite sad in some ways to talk about uh, people, the struggles they have in giving birth and our need to remember them. Here, here's the interesting things. This is from San Francisco, San Francisco Association, the Long Child Association. And what they're doing is it's again, a record of, of money paid for how they collected the bones. So you would have Westerners who's going around the countryside thinking, finding bones. It reminds me of the time uh, of uh, when I was in Vietnam, we were talking about refugees and we would pay uh, for, uh, for people returning uh, bones or remains of soldiers killed in Vietnam. But uh, 60 sets of Westerners and this is what they pay, 17 sets. In the old, in the originally they would gather the bones and they just ship, ship them back, maybe in burlap bags and stuff, but burlap bags or other boxes. But eventually they settled on these type of things toward the end. These are metal containers in which the bones are put in and they're stored in one place. This happens to be in Victoria and you await a ship but to be sent back to Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong is usually receiving them at this place, the Donghua Hospital. They receive the bones and they care for them, make sure they're recorded, and then they're sent back to uh, home districts. And home districts are settled here in what we call secondary burials until the actual relatives come and pick them up and then they're taken to their proper family grave area where the rites can, can be carried out. It's interesting, you know, here is, uh, it's interesting. This is simply a marker that says in this place, there were people uh, from California, like Joe Ding San, and they were sent, and they were sent 457 men. And then they have 467, or 457 men and 467 women. And I, I can't quite understand how that works because there weren't that many women according to our American records being sent back. But here it is this record. So we need a little bit more research to understand how that happens. Well, it happens also that in 1947 and so forth, a lot of people didn't collect the bones and the war interrupted the shipments. And so these guys are still there waiting. This is actually the Dunghua Hospital where these bones, ever since the, particularly since the start of the World War II, they're just there, but they're still waiting and waiting to be shipped back to the home districts. Um, but it's just, for right now, they're just being housed there. It's interesting that this Dunghua Hospital has also tried to, uh, tried to um, digitize the records. It, this type of cemeteries and these remembrance are happening all over the United States. Probably today, there's a lot of people going out. These are various cemeteries, uh, I think in Boston and Canada and different places. These are even older. This is the Harding Cemetery over in Canada, Victoria, Canada. Eventually what happens is a lot of the cemeteries are dug up, put into bone houses for storage. And then eventually, about 1937s and 40s, they reburied them and signifying they weren't going to send them back to China anymore. This, uh, this place no longer exists, this little memorial here. But the concept, one of the things that appears regularly is this, uh, this Jin Ru Zai. It's a statement that says to honor them as if they were here. We're back to Washington, and in Washington here, uh, this is the CCDA representative who is performing Ming rights. And I think that he is probably there now. And what it is, is the same things that talk about where we have individuals who died in the United States. And one of the promises that were made by CCDA or Family Association, that if you die, we're going to take care of the rights for you until we can send you back to China where your families can take care of your rights. These are so familiar scenes for anybody who has walked the mountain. But this is done for people without families largely, although there are now many members here who have uh, had their father, parents buried here and haven't, had been, haven't been able to send them back to China. And so this becomes a permanent resting place for them. This is, I mean, there are four cemeteries that CCBA goes through now the Washington National Cemetery, the Cedar Hill Cemetery, and the Fort Lincoln and George Washington Cemetery. These are places that are largely 
where the single people have died without families and they have taken themselves and they haven't missed a year for over 20 years to make sure that they keep their promise to honor the rights. In some ways, uh, there's another saying that the Chinese have when you get older, uh, uh, when you get older, you want to return back to your roots and that's where you find peace eventually. So that squares with, that's also matches this other thing. Maybe uh, we can't get back to China for some of these other people, and but we could still meet this uh, Confucian requirement of us to pay attention to the rights. And that is probably good enough for now. I wanna switch a little bit to something else. Uh, Go back to Washington, D.C., and this is a presentation I made at the Congressional Cemetery about the Congressional Cemetery for a conference in 20, a few years ago. And so this is Congressional Cemetery. I hope, I wonder how many of you people have actually been here. there. It's been, it's just up near the Potomac River, just down Pennsylvania Avenue. It's famous for things like this. Uh, it was set up for places where if uh, Congress people died when they're in office, this is John Quincy Adams. They would put up one of these things called cenotaphs. And not, there aren't any bodies that are just a memorial for, for the various congressmen and the various important people. They, have, they stopped doing that after a while. But the original part of the cemetery they, is a private cemetery in which the Congress had contracted for allowing them to put these cenotaphs there. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover is buried there. And uh, right next to J. Edgar Hoover, if you a few few uh, places down is uh, the memorial for uh, 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 you know for Mapovich who was um, uh, who was um, a decorated Marine, um, veteran from the Vietnam War who was also gay and it's also become a place where uh, people often congregate to tell stories or to remember this cause. Uh, John Phillips, it's also a place where both Civil War, Civil War people are buried, uh, both sides, South and North. It tells the entire, and John Philip Sousa's there. And then once, it's a fun cemetery because uh, on John Philip Sousa's birthday, the Marine Corps comes and they uh, do, uh, they march there and they also have uh, music and concerts there, picnics there. One of the, uh, they also have some other important people buried there. This is the, many of the Indians that were, uh, or the Native Americans who were the native trees with say, particularly Jackson, President Jackson had their relatives live in Washington DC and eventually were buried in the Congressional Cemetery or people, other people who've had cemetery, uh, uh, trees with the United States had uh, uh, representatives in Washington. A very important people, son of Cochise, uh, he's there. There's a number of other Indian tribes there. Before the Native American Museum was built on the mall, this is the place where there were actual powwows in which people, Native Americans, gathered to tell stories. A lot of stories, including, for example, the stories of these uh, young women who were part of the Civil War uh, uh, legends. They uh, operated a house not actually, not actually, not too far from where the American Indian Museum is now, and that they uh, they entertain a lot of the Civil War troops, including Hooker, uh, General Hooker, and that's where the name of Hookers came from. They have the most. Uh, uh, I think that their gravesite area is really fun. Uh, there's some stories there, and they're the one place that is welcome to all. Well, also within that cemetery, there's something called the Range 99. During a National Trust for Historic Preservation a conference or, or a gathering, somebody had told me there was something called, there was a range, a section of the cemetery that was reserved for Chinese. It's interesting that the CCBA doesn't come out here to do Qingming uh, because uh, there aren't actually any bodies there. It's actually the grave, the area where Chinese were buried, and then their bones were exhumed and sent back to China. So uh, not a few years ago, Su Li was from Chinese Historical Society, myself, Melissa Lin from, uh, from, uh, from, um, from one of the, um, the immigration service where I, work, where I worked with, 
for, uh, we all got together and said, let's find this place and see what's there. And we were able to locate the range where about 100 Chinese were actually buried at one time. That, this place and another section of the cemetery. And all their bones have gone. There's not, nothing to indicate that any Americans are, any, any Chinese are, were buried there. So we're pacing off in range 99 and we tell stories about uh, the people that were here. Uh, there's some good, uh, good cemetery records of who they were. Uh, but we decide that uh, we're going to mark the space. And we uh, put up a couple of benches underneath this huge shady tree where where the range 99 was, and that's Tom Fong, the head of CCBA at that time, so or the deputy head of CCBA. And so CCBA and the Chinese American Citizen Science, uh, Citizens Alliance and us, uh, with a few people in the cemetery and Melissa there, we all create this space where people can re rest. As if, and we put up a plaque that used that sign, Ching Wu Zai, honor those people that were here as if they were here. And so that was the uh, plaque that we put on the ground there. The honor as if here, that, so we did. The fun, terrible thing, however, was that after we had put that thing up, the tree, the huge tree where this place had been, uh, had the huge tree to provide the huge, the, the shade and the comforting place where it was and our benches and the wall behind it, all collapsed, and so that 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 memorial we then replaced. I replaced it with a couple of metal things, and it's very hot and not so comforting anymore. So what we want to do now is to re uh, re um, uh, uh, anyway lay. Uh, we want to take the place, and we want to uh, rent. Uh, uh, put a couple of trees and plant a few things there. And this, we developed a plan. Jen Lowe, who is now our deputy director for the 1882 Foundation, has, uh, has helped us a lot. And Paul Linter and helped us develop this thing. And we decide that we want to fix up the bench, fix up the area so it becomes more comfortable, plant a few trees there so it becomes nice and restful. And that's uh, Jen's rendition of what the place might look like once we have finished and what we're asking for is people to help us and this is the cost of what we do to do this so if you have a and one of the things we're trying to do is uh, uh, put little pavers and bricks that might include names of each of the uh, of the districts where the southern uh, where people came where most of the people came from from to go came from to work in the United States so if you have a you have a few dollars and you want to help uh, help us with this, we are short twelve thousand dollars to get this done. I think it's very important for us to make sure that uh, the Chinese American part of the larger American story is visible. Otherwise, nobody knows that it's there. Nobody knows that we are part of the history. So that's basically. Uh, the end of the sort of presentation I have uh, talks about a number of things and the talk story events as, as uh, Stan had mentioned is, uh, is a place for us to tell our stories. We gather together to tell stories because our life depends upon our life of our community lies in the power of our stories shared, stories of our community and strength. So if you wanna help us, that's, uh, that's the place, uh, the picture is where our office is behind the, uh, the red doors or underneath the red doors. That's the Moy Family Association and we're underneath there. But uh, before I leave, I just wanted to leave one other thought. Uh, that's back to my brother who is honoring the parents. Uh, we don't have to understand all the things that need to be done with it, whether it's the food or the roast pig. There's a lot of significance for the roast pork to be there, uh, but if we could just use this time to remember our history, I think that that's significant enough. We started off with the idea that the Red Book, which I wanted to look at my own genealogy and find that, and to find something 2,000 years old, we find out that a lot of what we're trying to do has to do with the, the analects record of performing the rites. We have that connection. We have that uh, 
uh, we find we have that connection and that that gives us a little bit of faith of where we came from. And now with my son going where I can see that that line continues. There's some strength in knowing that. But then what you find out is that uh, it's not just the connection to the China that is important. In fact, that's not important at all. One of the things that we find is and that's the second record, the third stone here that talks, let's honor that, respect that connection as if they were, were there, as if the people were there, they contribute to what, who and what we are. But the other story of, we go back to our roots. That's the final resting place where we sort of like uh, 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 can finally relax. It's not necessarily back in China, but it could be back in the, it's in the United States now. And one of the things that I wanna talk about is that our next coming up events, uh, We've done Talk Story for almost 10 years now. Every month we've done something. And that's one of the key things that we want to continue to do because we want to tell stories, our own stories. And our next story coming up, the next story is April 18. Three Calcutta Wallace. <laughs> I think it's going to be pretty interesting because we, as we learn more and more about our history, it's not just the guys that came for the gold rush or the railroads and we now know it's even beyond those guys who went through Cuba or Mexico and started in the, that with the, the, uh, the Southern Chinese story. But there's also guys that came from the other side. How, in this case, we're going to hear from Francis Pan and his friends about how their lives came from China or their line came from China through India and to the United States. So look forward to that. That's April 18th. May 17, 18 and 19, we're going to do our annual 1882 symposium. There'll be three webinars on webinars in a row. Uh, we're going to do one that talks about uh, museums and public uh, uh, public education and talking about how do museums actually engage with public and how uh, 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 how to make that work in today's uh, uh, in today's um, technology. The second one, the second webinar will be, what did we actually do, our museums and historians, public historians, in coping with COVID? What did they actually uh, use and what are the processes they're going to complete? Um, and then the other one is educational directions. We're going to have a, a lively or great discussion about the various ways in which we're working with uh, curriculum and lesson plans and development. Lots happening there that way. So that's going to happen May 17, 18. These other things, what do you think? Our events are designed to encourage you to tell us your stories and share our stories. So these are the things that we have are under discussion or al almost ready to be scheduled. And we want to hear from what you think of the lineup and whether or not you have any other thoughts. In June, we're thinking about doing something on our Timeless Echo series, starting with the Page app. Trying to, that's the act that prohibited women from coming, Chinese women from coming into the United States and how that affected uh, current day situations, say with the Atlanta killings and things of this sort. So that uh, is something we look forward to. In July, we've had a long discussion with Harry Chow and his, uh, his experience with Bruce Lee and the martial arts in DC. So that's Harry and Bruce Lee. Harry Chow and Bruce Lee, that's what that title is gonna be. I hope that, that that happens. He's got a lot of uh, insights on uh, martial arts, line dancing, and this sort of stuff that's happening in DC. August 9, we're going to try something new. It's called Eye on Eye Street. It's going to be a double seven event. That double seven is the event, Chinese event, that brought the weaving lady and the cowherd together once a year. It's sort of called Chinese Valentine's Day. But hopefully in August, we'll be busting out of the COVID thing. And doing something on the on I Street is something I think that is an, important for us to to do uh, to show that we are here and also to reclaim our area so this becomes the uh, uh, Chinatown becomes more important. And what we're trying to do is close off I Street for a weekend, maybe have chalk art and storytelling on that on that day. So uh, we uh, we haven't got it all figured out yet. But uh, that's something that we hope we can do and get a lot of support for. In August, we have, uh, uh, I hope we have something called Southern Conversation. And that's including a couple of films that are listed to the Chinese. Baldwin Chu has finished a book, uh, film and there's another person 
Christopher Park was talking about Chinese in Atlanta during the Jim Crow period. We also will have an event with CACA that talks about veterans oral history. We are veterans oral history in World War II um, gold medal. That will happen in uh, August. And then of course in September, we have our mid honor Moon Festival movie in the night park movie in the in in the park so tell me which film you want and i really don't want to see another uh Kung Fu panda film but let me know what you want we'll see what we can do october we have jake lee paintings with sue lee talking about the social political significance of that and i hope that in november we can have the tell of three chinatowns that's penny lee uh who's created a new documentary about three chinatowns boston chicago and washington and I hope that we can have a conversation and talk about the significance of that film. In December 17th, we'll show our film Legacy about the Summit Tunnel and we'll talk about national monuments and how that process is going, process is going. So if you want to, to participate this and or you have other ideas what you want, want us to do, connect with Stan at that address, at that email, connect with me at that email. And then uh, also you can drop a note in the info1882foundation.org. The best way to know of who we, what we are doing is to get signed up or sign up into our mailing list. And this uh, is how you do it. Go to this, sign in and confirm that you are uh, want to receive our messages about times and dates of things that we're doing. Hey, Ted, uh, before you... Uh, uh, leave. Uh, there's a couple of comments in the chat uh, about your presentation here uh, that you might want to check out. You know, first, first one was from uh, N. Wong about are there only sons listed in 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 your genealogy and no daughters? You know, what happened to the daughters? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's one of the rules. Most of the genealogy records are just recording the sons. Uh, like I said, as an exception, I put my my daughter to the end. But uh, so uh, sorry, uh, daughters aren't usually listed unless they're. But there have been some where the daughters have become quite famous. Um, yeah. You don't they're, think that's changed now in modern mm -hmm. times? Because when I, I when I went to my visit to my home village, you know, I, I got the genealogy book there and I put my daughter's names on there. I don't know if they erased it or or what, but uh, but I. But they 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 seem to welcome it, so I don't know if it's, it's I like I, I like to see that happen. I just don't. I th I think there are exceptions. I've seen some uh, where it's done, but I don't. I think it becomes very unwieldy when you try to start lifting daughters and their marriages to that are, in theory, the daughter is going to be listed in her husband's or somebody else's uh, genealogy record, right? Uh, but the uh, so that's the way it were it works and culturally it um, it doesn't seem to be recorded that way. Although I have seen times where some woman has become famous for some reason, like uh, literature or something of this sort. And but my job, who we're pretty poor, <laughs> we haven't done too too much about that. I've seen you know Paula Madison, uh, who is. Um, who is a uh, half uh, a quarter Chinese and a quarter Jamaican and a quarter uh, African American of some, and she is very connected with her family uh, through the Chinese family, which happens to be a Hakka family, and so the Hakka people tend to be more um, tolerant for uh, uh, daughters, and she and maybe because of Paula. Uh, 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 she's a um, pretty well-known NBC executive in her time and has written a couple of books uh, and uh, supports the, the, the family genealogy. She actually uh, created an electronic record in which she included women in her, her that genealogy. I don't know how long that's going to continue, but the old ones, I would be surprised that uh, daughters were included. So, sorry. Maybe you can do like Stan and I did. We'll take our little record and add our daughter's name to it. But uh, does anybody else have any any any? Um... There, there's a couple other comments here. You know, one of them was you know the 1,200 Chinese uh, that, that y'all 
they died on the railroad. Is that what 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 that history is, or part of that? So so we're not sure how many people died in the railroad, and then we don't know how many people died from mine from the different mines or from different things throughout the throughout the country. Uh, for the for railroad, the record is there's the estimated that there's probably about twelve thousand people that died out of the 20,000 that actually work on the record. The record, that's extremely high to me. But I think it's, uh, well, let me see, let me go back. I think it's like a couple of thousand that were on the, actually hired by the Central Pacific to build the railroad, which was about 20, 12,000 people hired, about 2,000 died. What that record is, we don't have, what that record comes from is from railroad records that said they paid for the volume, the weight of 12,000 pounds of bones shipped back to China. And then uh, you kind of estimate, well, what is, what is the poundage of one person in <laughs> bones? And so you come up with this number of what it represents. But that's 12,000 pounds of bones, right? That is in the Central Pacific Railroad records that they paid for as part of fulfillment of the contract that they have with the individual workers. Uh, okay, uh, and, and another comment was from Eric Hung about about his parents' shoes and cremation. So do you think a lot of the Chinese here, uh, instead of having wanting their bones shipped back, uh, have chose cremation? Or I'd be interested in hearing what other people's experience is on that. Is there uh, is there any uh, any cultural hesitancies in cremating a body? Uh, uh, I don't know. Eric, do you have comments on that, Eric Hung? Hi, um, no, I don't. Uh, I, I know, I mean, I think, I mean, being from Hong Kong is fairly common because there's no land. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't know if it's cultural or practical. I don't know, you know, in, you know, I was in Guangzhou, I was very interested in trying to find out what, how these uh, traditional ceremonies uh, continued. And on Qingming, so when the Qingming went out to the, the, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of the old cemeteries have been torn down and their stones and things of this were used to build public works. But so then that raises, well, what happened to the, <laughs> and then what did they do afterwards? So uh, the crematorium and, and in China, uh, cremation is, uh, the main process by which they handle uh, death, right? So if you go to Qingming and you go over to where the, uh, in Guangzhou, and you go over to where the, uh, um, what would you call it, the cemetery is, uh, there'll be rows and rows and rows of these boxes that are really high, you know, that are, old, that are, I don't know, you can't say blocks high, but there's certainly ceiling highs in which you have a cubby hole where the, uh, the, the um, the remains the uh, the ashes are, and then I've seen people like they would take out the ashes, the boxed ashes, and they would go over to some clear spot in the cemetery, open up the ashes, put the incense there, and then do the same things they would try to normally have done at a sweep at a tomb. So instead of sweeping the tombs, they would take the box of ashes, put it out, and then they would put the uh, incense and the uh, three. Uh, three cups of wine and that sort of stuff and have their celebration or not the memorial service there. And then after they're done, close up the box, take back uh, mother and father, <laughs> put them back in the cubby hole. That's, that's kind of an interesting, yeah. Okay. Yeah, my, my parents chose um, a simpler method, which is that they have a, a little plaque in um, a temple, uh, but their, their ashes are actually in the sea. Mm, 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 mm. So in, in essence, actually, I've always thought that a Jia, like the Zubu, and if anybody has any other records, I actually think that the Zubu, if you go to a temple, like in, in the old traditional temple, you see all the plaques of names against the wall, right? So essentially, that to me is the physical Zabu, which has been written down on paper, right? So you would have the rows and rows of different generations in each of the of the of the people that made up um, made up that clan. It's right there. So in many ways, if you just put up the metal plaque later on, that's actually consistent 
with what should be done in terms of recording and memorializing your family record and family genealogy. Okay. Okay. Also, we had some comments from Juliet War. Juliet, would you like to elaborate on, on your comments? Juliet Wurr. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking of seeing all those wonderful pictures of Ted going around in China and looking at those different sites. And I just thought to myself, A, I know how the U.S. Um, a diplomatic security does not let you wander around freely. And I certainly know that uh, the Chinese government must be on your every move. So I was interested in that. And then I forgot actually the years that you were in China. And finally, thank you for your service. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I tell this other story where actually, uh, I actually, uh, the, the, so, so there are levels of the Chinese government, of course, and then their effectiveness is not as, as, uh, as uh, they're not as effective as one would assume that a communist government should be, right? So the local yeah. guys and the national guys and the state guys, they have certain policies and they try to enforce them. But, uh, and we, we, by and large, as you know, Julia, pay attention to them. But in the case of this, uh, uh, of this going back to the uh, gravesite and so forth, one, it's, it was within our district, you know, in, mm. in the Guangzhou district, you're gonna, um, you can only, when we were there, you had a limitation on distance that you can leave from the Guangzhou area, right? So we went to so many miles out, we had to get advance permission from the, uh, the, the foreign ministry to do this. But the area where my, uh, my, 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 my ancestors grave sites was, was within our district. It's just a little bit above uh, Guang, uh, Gu uh, Guangzhou. It's actually where the current international airport is right now. So it, what? So we could go, and then the local guys, the local officials, were very eager at that time, and I think it was policy to try to attract uh, overseas Chinese to come back to reinvest in China, right? So my father uh, was coming back and they wanted to attract him to come back to the village and to invest and, and, and so forth. And one of the things of course, is to take him back to where his father, his grandfather, well actually in this case, his father, grandfather and ancestors were to show them that there was still continued respect for the traditions. Cultural revolution is over we're back to trying to protect property rights and the uh, traditions of the old. And so therefore you should come back and invest. So of course I'm part of my father's group that goes back to China, right, right to the village. And so we go over there. And uh, uh, one of the interesting things is that they take us out, this group of officials, <laughs> you know, they take us out and they say, okay, here's where there's some interesting, other interesting things about them showing a land deed that's supposed to be have my father and my brother's names <laughs> or a piece of property. And they say, okay, you can have back if you want. <laughs> and then the, guy, the guy who was actually living there is sort of blurted out, wait a minute, you didn't say anything about that. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, so that was, but then we went out to the uh, gravesite, which is the nice, you know, countryside ride up to the place, up to that nice place that I showed you. And then uh, uh, as we're walking up the mountain, uh, you get, and we do this thing and walking back down the mountain, then it's a single, single, single sort of a thing. When we get to the top, all the officials standing in the back, and they're very happy. He says, oh, my father is, does his, his uh, incense thing and things like this sort. And I do my duty for him too. And then we walk back and we kind of get separated from the officials that walk the single line. So I asked my father, he says, hey, dad, do you think that really was where our ancestors were. <laughs> he goes, nah. <laughs> I, I don't think so at all. He says, but you know, what the heck, you know, it's been like 40 years and I needed a place to go and that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> that was the way we went. Good. That was good. So is that why you chose that posting? I, I, you know, you, as you know, in, in a foreign service, we put a preference of where we want to go. Yeah. And we don't, we don't always get the places we go to. Uh, and uh, I had put that as one of the postings I wanted to go to. 
Uh, but that wasn't necessarily my first post. That wasn't my first post. No, no these are. Yeah. And how many Chinese uh, posts in China did you do? I did, uh, I did Guangzhou twice, Taipei twice. And, uh, wow. Yeah. And Hong Kong once. So. Wow. Okay. Well, as I said, thank you for your service. It's, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> We blame why well, I don't know why you can't do a little bit with our relationship now, but anyway, thank you. And uh, maybe Helen Lou wants to elaborate more on your on your comment about women losing their identity. Helen. Helen Lou, you want to comment or not? Oh, it's the question. Well, she, she mentions that that when she visit took a look at her family tree on her mother's side, the women were listed in family married name, not by their first and last maiden name. In other words, they lost their identity when they got married. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, I had my um, mute. Okay, let me. Okay. Uh, yeah, in um, 2017, I went to um, China with Rita Moy uh, to visit uh, my parents' village. And um, in the process of doing, before doing that, uh, I contacted my cousins on my mother's side to look at the family tree that they had been pulling together. And when looking at that family tree, I noticed that the men. They were all identified by name and everything. But the woman, all they had was um, the married last name, like, uh, like my, um, my mother, my mother's a Ng. So all the, all the women um, that were in the family tree, they just had them as Ng. But you didn't know what their first name and, and what, their, um, what their maiden name was before they, they married. And, um, and I, had, I had no idea other than the fact that uh, the Chinese culture um, recognizes the, the the male side, and uh, once you, once you marry, uh, you're part of the family tree of of the male side. But even on the male side, uh, they don't identify what your 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 uh, maiden name is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in my in my sure family, yeah. In my family genealogy book, they only list, they only list the surnames. The, uh, so I guess that, that's pretty standard. They just sort of list the surnames. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I'm not even sure if it's sort of like the, uh, 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 how did you put it? It was sort of like the uh, uh, trivializing or uh, Redu uh, not identifying trying they just weren't identified as important enough, I guess in those days uh, but they were so one of the one of the the one of the uh, talk stories I really want to do is relates to war brides uh, I want to talk mm -hmm. about the page app uh, which actually is the Americans American sort of the first uh, uh, prohibitions against Chinese immigration and then eventually used to the 1882 Newton Act was to prohibit Chinese women from coming to the United States. The idea being that if they came, then Chinese families would start. Go <laughs> figure. But see, uh, the reason they chose was that all Chinese women were immoral or prostitutes. And part of that is from sort of our impressions of who they are and from missionary accounts or our own stereotypes. But the other, so we want to talk about the page app and how that leads or reinforces the idea of, of uh, nameless women who are over-sexualized or who then leads into various stereotypes that talk about them either being dragon ladies or uh, people, uh, prostitutes and opium dens. But then we also wanna talk about the War Brides Act and how that act in the 19, after, during World War II is so important in the formation of families. And so we want to have that talk story, so stay tuned. If you guys were, I have memories of your parents who might have been war priced like my, my mother was. Uh, we'd love to have you part of that conversation as well. 
you know, one person I see, Emmy, Emmy I don't know, Emmy, if you, I see that you're, um, Emmy Dunn, I see you're online. Um, glad to see you. She's been doing a lot of work, a great work in Mississippi area related to Chinese cemeteries and so forth. I don't know if Emmy, you would like to say a few things about what's going on. Okay, how about Ted, I have a question, Ted. This is Nancy Wong. I don't have video. My video's not working for some reason. But so you're in your in your book, you're gonna continue writing your family line and you're including your daughter i see <laughs> but um what your brothers are they continuing with you know from their line on down so that in your generation there will be three books is that how it goes i don't i don't know and i've done this just for myself i know that i have another cousin uh who is in fresno area who was more interested in trying to do an entire rewrite of the book and so I don't know exactly what the rules that she's going to include on that. Uh, so, you know, I'm not really doing anything more than doing something for my personal record. <laughs> so we'll see how that works. It'd be interesting. There are more, I think there are more and more families trying to come together and figuring out that the way you unite uh, people or you bring together these people is the rewriting of a genealogy book. It's certainly, it's certainly overdue because every time there's a major move or something that happens in the generations, then that's the time we need to update and, and redo the book. And of course, as Juliet or some other people have mentioned, you make our own rules about how to write your books. And so uh, I think that somebody from should be talking about that 32nd generation that came to the United States primarily, and that we basically have started our own stories uh, about, uh, the continuation of this uh, of, uh, of our, our our family or our clan records in the United States. I'm sure that there are other people who are gone who might be writing about their branch and how what they're doing in Malaysia or what they're doing in Australia. And it's time for us in America to probably write our own. Oh, so I was wondering then, like the. I don't know if it's not the Chinese Benevolent Association, but the the family associations. My like, I'm a Wong, so I know there's a Wong family association. <laughs> don't they keep track of a lot of this kind of stuff? But that's Did where you, you know? that's exactly where you would actually do it. Uh, if every time you report, uh, get a birth, you, you have a child or something, you're supposed to be reporting it to these guys to be recorded. So I guess it all depends on how active your family association is. Uh, we certainly have a um, an association hall in San Francisco, and, and the group there is uh, doing their things. But our the people that I'm most uh, effective uh, associated with have broke off from the San Francisco group for a while. We still have that sort of affinity to them, but you know, different politics and different uh, things issues have arisen with the Visayas Central Valley people are essentially formed their own association hall in ICA, California, right? And so uh, those are all there as well. Ted? Yeah. Um, there is a uh, genealogy library in Salt Lake City in Utah. Are the Chinese including any of their genealogies and stories there? I think so. And it's not so much that the Chinese are trying to include it, but the Mormons themselves and the church there is, is, is probably the best collector of genealogies from everywhere, including, uh, uh, including from China. I understand that some of the best collections are over there in Salt Lake City uh, because, because of their, their faith in trying to find or, or recover 
you know, find people who should be part of, uh, I don't know what the right word is, the people that should be saved. <laughs> and so they keep these records there. So that that is one place where the best records are actually in Salt Lake City. So we should encourage each other to include our, our genealogies there as well. I, yeah, I mean, I think you shouldn't just include it anywhere you can. <laughs> so, so that's that's one that's <clears throat> National Arch. I don't know what the National Archives does. Does anybody else know where other records? The other another place that you're talking about records, um, they're not genealogy records, but they're the, all the immigration records at the National Archive. Um, those are some of the best records are at San Bruno National Archives, but uh, they have all the Chinese exclusion file records are there, but also in Seattle and uh, and and different places, uh, they have these immigration records. There's an effort to try to consolidate all of them in in the effort to save money, say close the Seattle office. Now I don't know if uh, there's an effort to try to prevent that from happening. In my mind, actually, having worked in the immigration department and so forth, you would be better off to consolidate these records in their main office in Kansas City, if that comes with the digitization of the records. You know, right now, there many of them are just hard copies. But if I can have all those records digitized and placed in one place and maintained by people who know how to look at these records and stuff, which is what the US immigration, immigration historian was able to do. But if they were all digitized and they were managed by a group of people who were subject matter experts, I think that's far better than trying to maintain separate offices, in our offices, even though they may be physically closer to you, your ability to sort of get the records is much more enhanced if they're digitized. And uh, if you've ever been to the uh, the National Archives records in Kansas City, uh, that's a good place to put them, <laughs> actually, to store them. Okay, okay uh, Ted, I think, you know, we're, we're all, long past the, the top of the hour here. So yeah, I, th I think, you know, officially, you know, we want to end the session, but as, but before we do that, you know, I want to thank you for your, you know, expert presentation. You're very interesting at, on this Qing and a good, proper, appropriate celebration of Qing Ming Day to, to get this um, presentation from you. And also I want to thank Bianca for taking care of the technical details on, on our presentation today. And, uh, you know, and I typically after the formal presentation is done, you know, we, we stay open for a little while. So if anybody wants to chat, you know, it'll, it's sort of open mic time now. Just unmute yourself and speak up. But everybody else, you know, you're free to free to probably drop off whenever you feel like it. Uh, but, you know, those of you who commented uh, in the chat, thank you for your participation. If you have something you want to say live, you know, unmute yourself and speak up and, and, and thank you for your participation today. It's, it's a great day today. Enjoy the day. At least it here is in D.C. So. <laughs>